So while the 2600 was an extremely successful console in its early years, Atari wouldn't have the same luck with their future ones. Case in point, the Atari 7800 failed to compete against the NES. Not many people wanted to buy this console because of Atari's poor reputation and mediocre lineup of games. Speaking of games, they didn't look all that impressive compared to the NES. But here's the question. Was the 7800 less powerful than the NES, or is there something we're missing? Well, let's take a look. I really hope my voice doesn't sound really weird. I'm coming on a cold. What's going on, guys? It's Poger coming at you with another video. So we're going to be talking about the Atari 7800 today. So I want to give a special shout out to Acernosoft, who is a developer for the Atari 7800 and other consoles. He's honestly done some really, really good work, and I'm glad he's part of the community. I want to thank him, though, because he did help a lot with this episode. He's been showing us the step-by-step -step progress of his game in our Discord server. Speaking of which, if you want to be part of the Discord server, just go to discord.poger.net. I was streaming quite a few tier lists the other day, and we were having a good time. Domino's. I think they're the least innovative of all the pizza places. They are the only pizza chain of the big four that still do not have stuffed crust pizza. Like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> like, where is it? Why don't you have it on the menu? <laughs> that really bothers me. <laughs> so if you've seen a couple of my videos and you like what I do, hit that subscribe button right there. It only takes a quick second, but it helps our channel grow. Anyway, I'm probably going to take some cold medicine and then go to sleep. Atari just reinvented the video game with this, the Atari 7800. Incredible, huh? Uh, <laughs> so powerful it plays like the best arcade game with real joysticks, right? <laughs> With the success of the 2600, Mattel released the Intellivision. This new console had some advantages over its competitor. For one, the sound was much better. Rather than having Pong sounds like on Atari's console, the Intellivision used more realistic sound effects. Secondly, the games had more space to work with. The console itself came with 4 kilobytes of ROM space built in. This extra space contains the software framework, which allowed developers to make games more easily, and contained reusable code that essentially made a 4 kilobyte game an 8 kilobyte one. The Intellivision had slightly better graphical capabilities than the 2600, and you could definitely see it in some of the games. Atari felt like they needed an answer to the Intellivision, so they released the 5200. Their new console had some things going for it. Cartridges could contain more ROM space than its predecessor, 32 kilobytes rather than 4. The RAM was upgraded from 128 bytes to 16 kilobytes, which is a huge increase. The games looked noticeably better too, closer to the arcade experience. So on paper, it seems like this is a much better console, but there were some problems. The first issue was the pack-in game Super Breakout. Not a bad version of the game, but this title didn't show the capabilities of the Atari 5200. To compare, the ColecoVision's packing game was Donkey Kong, which was the best arcade port that was available at the time. This did show the true power of the ColecoVision. In my opinion, Atari should have made the 5200 version of Pac-Man the included game. Like with Donkey Kong, this was the best home console version of the game at the time. The second issue was the poor lineup of games. Most of the titles on the 5200 were just upgraded versions of 2600 games. There weren't a lot of original titles. The controllers were also some of the worst in gaming history. The console used analog controls, which was very ambitious, but the design choice they went with was very sloppy. The analog stick was extremely unreliable, and it made games much more difficult to play. But the biggest problem with the 5200, it was not backwards compatible with 2600 games. Considering the 2600 had a great library of games, a lot of consumers didn't want to bother with the 5200. It's unfortunate because after playing some of these games for this video, there's definitely some fun to be had. If the console had a better controller and more games, I think the 5200 would have been okay. 
So what happened to the console? Not only did the 5200 underperform, but Atari was feeling the pressure from its competition. The ColecoVision had slightly better hardware than the 5200, which meant its games were more arcade accurate. As a response, Atari would release a new console that was more powerful, but rather than making one themselves, they commissioned someone else to do it. In the early 80s, the company GCC was making money modifying existing arcade games. Their first game was a hack of Missile Command. When Atari threatened legal action against them, rather than taking it to court, they settled. Atari recognized that there was some great talent at GCC, so they commissioned them to make more projects. Now that GCC was working for Atari, we would start seeing some great innovations. Most of their 2600 games had very impressive visuals, lots of content packed into one game, or were just very accurate arcade ports. In some cases, they did a better job than Atari did. It was really smart that Atari decided to work with GCC rather than go forward with a lawsuit, and this would pay off in 1984. Atari knew that they messed up with the 5200, and if they wanted to make a new console, they probably shouldn't do it themselves. So GCC began development on the Atari 7800. Unfortunately though, this console wouldn't be released in June of 1984 like Atari wanted. Well, why not? Atari's reputation was going downhill. There wasn't any quality control, so many mediocre games were flooding the market. There was no Nintendo seal of quality back then, so anyone could make a game and sell it, no matter how bad it was. Sometimes it was even Atari that was making some of these mediocre games. Not only that, but the failure of the 5200 destroyed whatever credibility they still had. By 1983, consumers were not interested in buying video games anymore. Because of this, the new CEO of Atari, Jack Trammell, shifted focus from the home console market to the computer market. And as a result, the 7800 would be shelved. Had this console been released at the original time they wanted, it would have been more powerful than anything that was out at the time, at least in the US. But instead, the console would be released in May of 1986 after the success of the NES. In some aspects, the 7800 hardware was superior to the NES. The console had more RAM, 4 kilobytes, than the NES, which was only at 2 kilobytes. The screen resolution was also better on the 7800, 320 by 240 pixels, than the NES, which was only 256 by 240 pixels. 7800 games could carry more data as well, a total of 48 kilobytes, versus the NES which could only carry 32 kilobytes. So what did this all look like? Well, let's take a look at some of the games. Here's a popular one, Ball Blazer. I have to comment on the music, it's fantastic. You're basically playing a game of soccer, where you have to get the ball in the goal while avoiding your opponent. It's a two-player game, but thankfully they give you the option to play against the CPU. The 3D perspective is really nice to see, and it shows what the 7800 is capable of. The console needed more games like this if they wanted to beat Nintendo. Now, I can't talk about the 7800 without discussing Ninja Golf. The game starts out as a basic golf simulator, but in between turns you're fighting off bad guys. It's a really creative and unique title. The graphics are also very nice with some parallax scrolling. For 7800 standards, this is a fantastic game, but if we're looking at the bigger picture, this is honestly a pretty basic game. None of the levels have any platforms, the bosses are all the same, and there's not much variety in this one. There's also no background music whatsoever. It's an okay game, but if we're comparing this to the NES, which had many great titles, this one is honestly nothing special. Now we're going to look at a few arcade ports. Here's Galaga. It's an okay version, but the graphics are pixelated, the enemies move very slow, and in general, it's not super appealing to look at. The NES would receive Galaga as well, and this one is much better. Now let's look at Kung Fu Master. It's playable, but once again, the graphics look very pixelated. The controls are also really bad in this version. It's very clunky to play, and you can only jump straight up. You can't jump in a direction. 
The NES would receive this game as well, this time it would just be called Kung Fu, and this one has way smoother controls, and graphically it's much more appealing. Now here's Ms. Pac-Man. Great version of the game, but like with the others, it looks pixelated, and a few years later, Atari Games, also known as Tengen, would make an NES version. This one looks way more like the arcade original, and even features new levels. So, the NES wins in all these cases. Finally, let's look at Desert Falcon. It's a decent Zaxxon clone, not much to say about it, but I have to comment on the sound. It sounds more like an Atari 2600 game. In fact, most of the games I covered just now don't appear to sound any better than the 2600, besides Ball Blazer. So, does the 7800 have expanded sound capabilities, or is this the best the console can do? Now, shockingly, there's a 2600 version of Desert Falcon. It looks way worse, but listen to the sound. <laughs> They literally copied and pasted the sound from one game to the other. So, what's going on here? We just talked about how the 7800 has a few advantages over the NES, but I don't see any of that after looking at the games. The graphics look pixelated, the NES versions are better, and most of the games don't sound that great. Well, there's a few things holding the console back. Let's talk about the pixelation first. While the 7800 had a higher resolution than the NES, most of the games were forced to run in low resolution mode, which was only 160 by 240 pixels, because it supported a better color palette. In low resolution mode, you could have up to 25 colors on screen, but in high resolution mode, you could only have up to 9. Most of the games on the 7800 opted for low resolution mode to take advantage of the increased color palette, which resulted in pixelation. So why did all the games sound like the 2600? Well, because both consoles used the same sound chip. They didn't upgrade the sound capabilities at all for the 7800. Although a couple games did use the Pokey sound chip, which offered expanded audio. So while there were a few hardware advantages over the NES, the pixelation and sound limitations really made the games much less appealing. But it wasn't just hardware limits that killed the 7800. This console didn't get a lot of third-party support. Most of the really good developers like Konami and Capcom were making games exclusively for the NES. Those game companies were pushing the hardware limits and making impressive looking games, but no one was doing that for the 7800 because there wasn't a lot of third party support. So, what was this console truly capable of? Well, we have one more game to look at. So while the 7800 was discontinued in 1992, the community at Atari Age has been keeping the console alive with these homebrew games. One game I wanted to showcase is Bentley Bear's Crystal Quest. I think it's cool that Bentley Bear is getting the spotlight, because it's one of the few characters in the Atari universe who actually has a name. It's interesting that Atari never tried to make him their mascot. Anyway, it's a platformer that takes some inspiration from Adventure Island. You start off defenseless, but you can pick up a projectile weapon, and you have to avoid rocks, campfires, and enemies from the Crystal Castles universe. This game is unlike anything I've ever seen on the 7800. For one, this is a floaty platformer which is uncommon for this console. Usually when I hear Atari, I think of clunky controls, but this game plays just like a Mario game would. The 7800 honestly needed more games like this. Secondly, the graphics are unbelievable. There's a lot of color on the screen, and many layers of parallax scrolling in some stages. Honestly, this could pass as a Sega Master System game. This is something I've never seen on the NES. I really wanted to cover this particular game because I feel like the 7800's potential was never reached, and this title really showcases the console's true capabilities for the first time. So, does this mean the 7800 is more powerful than the NES?
So while the 7800 had some hardware advantages over the NES, it also had a bigger rulebook. If you wanted the higher resolution, you had to sacrifice the large color palette that the 7800 came with. But if you chose to have more colors, you had to deal with pixelation which made the console look inferior to the NES. In the sound department, the NES beat the 7800 by a long shot. So overall, the 7800 had some advantages and the NES had some advantages, but the 7800's advantages had too many asterisks with them. If there were more companies making games for this console, they might have been able to learn how to work around the limitations, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, hit that like button. If you enjoy this type of content, hit the subscribe button for more content. Both of these things really help the channel grow. If you have anything to share, feel free to leave a comment. I read every single comment on this channel, and I'm pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one.